Okay, welcome again, everybody, to the <laughs> Mentorship Speaker Series, presenting uh, Dr. Annie Lee in um, her presentation titled All in This Together, Promoting Emotional Wellness Through Collective Experiences During COVID-19. Um, Annie Lee is a child and adolescent psychiatrist practicing in NYC. She is currently on faculty at New York Presbyterian Hospital Wild Cornell Medical Center and is the chief of the Pediatric Emergency Psychiatry Service. In July, she will be transitioning to her new role as a medical director of the Children Comprehensive Emergency Psychiatry Program at Bellevue Hospital. Thank you again for everyone's patience. Dr. Annie Lee, please take it away. Well, thank you. Um, as you can see, we live in such unprecedented times that no matter how much we prepare, we cannot anticipate what the current present moment is going to be like. And in that moment of intense stress, I would imagine, um, of, and, and frustration potentially, now more than ever, we really need to talk about how to manage ourselves and really take care of ourselves um, uh, in, this, in this unprecedented time and really kind of checking and making sure that you know emotionally and mentally we're doing okay um and so we're going to be doing a little bit of reflection um and we're going to draw on our collective experiences during this time to try to find a way to build some form of resilience um through this pandemic so as we go on what i want all of you to do um is to find a writing instrument that you have a pen a marker or a crayon um, a piece of paper that you have around you. If not, pull out a word processing document um, in, in your computer screen and make sure that you're gonna be ready to jot down some answers through our guided prompts. And we're gonna be kind of playing a little game of Mad Lib. And at the end of the day, um, at the end of this hour, um, I want you guys to be able to walk away with something tangible, okay? So we're gonna be creating our own COVID-19 narrative, okay? We're gonna be, um, thinking and reflecting about identifying who we are, the hats that we wear. Um, we're gonna name the emotions that we're feeling. We're gonna also list all the responsibilities that we are actually um, participating in in a daily life, in our daily day-to-day -day activity. And then we're gonna think about how things are gonna be like for us in the future. Um, and through that, we're gonna create a story that hopefully you will be able to share um, with others around you um, and, and, and um, you know, create a sense of a time capsule, so to say. So without further ado, let's begin to do that. Prompt one is becoming aware of who we are. And by the way, I'm gonna be doing this exercise with all of you. Um, and hopefully you will be able to learn about my narrative a little bit. Um, and it will be kind of like an example that you guys can kind of also um, copy a little bit. So this is how I answered this prompt. So first of all, I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist. My day-to-day -day involves um, interacting with youths and families who are really struggling to function in, um, in the community, whether that may be in the home setting, in the school setting, in their peer groups. And my job is to also diagnose and identify underlying conditions that may be impacting their functioning. Sometimes that could be a depression, a depressive episode. Sometimes it could be anxiety. And sometimes it could be just, you know, um, attention issues, um, hyperactivity issues, or sometimes it can be even more rooted from earlier on in childhood in conditions like autism um, or other, uh, other learning disorders as well. In addition to identifying and diagnosing those conditions, I also have to think about how I'm going to help, um, you know, these individuals. And that requires me to administer therapeutic interventions, um, whether that may be in the form of therapy or sometimes it could be also in the form of medications. Now, in my particular uh, clinical setting, I um, see patients in the emergency room. And so I see a lot of youth and families come through an emergency room when maybe things in life have reached a breaking point um, and they're coming in an acute crisis. And that may be, um, you know, an attempt to end their lives or an attempt to, um, you know, think about, you know, being in a hopeless situation. It could be sometimes be very disruptive behaviors um, with aggression and agitation where um, the safety of others are, um, you know, are, are concerning. And we offer to try to offer a sense of safety and stabilizations for individuals and families. Now, how did I become a child adolescent psychiatrist? 
Um, first, um, I had to go through four years of undergraduate school. And I would preface to say that early on in my high school career, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't know what kind of doctor I wanted to be, though. Um, so when I was in you know, college, I took the pre-med courses. I majored in biochemistry. I also am a very humanities person. So I also minored in history as well. And I went to Stony Brook University out in Long Island. Um, and then I attended four years of medical school at Albert Einstein College of Medicine up in the Bronx. And, and originally I knew that I thought I first thought I was going to be an internal medicine doctor. And then I was like, well, I really like working with kids. So I'm going to become a pediatrician. And then I realized I hate procedures. I don't like to have to put in IVs. I don't like to suture. And I really like talking to people. And um, that's when I found my calling to childless and psychiatry. It's a combination of both. Um, and then afterwards, I have to go through three years of general adult psychiatry residency. And I did that at Wild Cornell, where I'm actually currently working. And then following that, um, it's two years of child health and psychiatry fellowship. So you, cause you can see um, the pathway um, can be quite long. If I do the math correctly, it's about four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13 years in the making. In addition to my role as a child and psychiatrist, I'm also a mother of two children. Um, I'm also a wife. I'm also a daughter. And I'm also a sister. And I imagine that all of you are probably wearing some same hats, being a daughter, um, being a sister uh, to someone, um, being a friend to someone. Um, we all wear many different hats. Now, another hat that I want to bring up is that I'm a Chinese American immigrant. And I think that, you know, COVID-19 has made me become more aware of my identity, in part because of the um, sense of growing uh, xenophobia and some of the concerns about hate crimes and um, racist remarks, um, which I am very mindful of. Um, and that, you know, it's something that has impacted me um, individually. So I was originally born in Hong Kong. Um, and I came to this country with my family at around six years of age. And this is a picture of the family kind of at the airport, uh, bidding us a final farewell. Um, you know, part of the reasons why my family came, um, in the 1980s was because of, um, the Chinese takeover, um, from the British colony of Hong Kong to, to, to a China turnover in 1997. And, um, my grandmother had a lot of concerns about what that might look like. So came here and my family settled in the Southern part of Brooklyn. And this is us growing up then. And I attended, um, public schools all the way. Um, I went to Mark Twain School for the Gifted and Talented for middle school. And I eventually went into, uh, Brooklyn Technical High School for my high school career. And who I am continues to be a big, strong part of my uh, personal and professional identification. Um, this is a recent picture um, at Chinese New Year. And then to the right is a picture of me at a recent national meeting. Um, and it was for uh, international graduates and I found my flag and I was like, I gotta take a picture of that. So, hopefully some of you may have had a chance to write in your prompts a little bit of who you are and um, you know what that may be. And then with prompt number two, I want you to fill out the blank. With COVID-19, I have been feeling, I'm pausing a little bit because I want you guys to think about this and jot it down. And then I'm gonna share with you what I wrote down in my response to this prompt. So for me, I have been feeling many different things. First, I felt ill because I ended up actually having COVID-19 um, by default of probably of my work in the emergency room. Um, I felt guilty when I got sick that I couldn't help out my colleagues in the front line. I was scared because I was worried about um, whether I was gonna pass it on to my family members, my parents who are of older age, my younger children, um, and, and to my other colleagues. I was also scared whether I was gonna walk out in public and be a victim of any racist um, remarks. 
Um, I felt tired because we were pulling in long hours. There were so many changes taking place in the hospital and we were constantly trying to keep up with new guidelines, new protocols, new rules. Um, and there are times where things weren't moving fast enough or that all of us were, um, you know, trying to do something and it wasn't working out. And I got easily angry and frustrated. Um, I felt overwhelmed a lot. Um, I also felt sad because in the past week, I actually lost um, family members to this illness, um, which I'm still kind of mourning and grieving for. And in the midst of all of that, I also felt a lot of love because um, so many people from near and far reached out to me. Um, and I'm reminded of how precious, um, you know, my health is and my family is. And so I felt a lot of love and I was really thankful too. You know, sometimes when I hear um, the 7 p.m. Um, applause and claps, it does make me feel thankful that, you know, so many of my colleagues and myself are being kind of, you know, honored um, in a way that, you know, in the past we would have never imagined. Now, if you're wondering whether you may feel some of these things or you may feel more than that, I put in the feeling wheel, just kind of highlight that there's no one feeling that's right or wrong during this time. Um, all the feelings that are listed in the feeling wheel are actually pretty appropriate because we all cope with um, this experience in such a very individual way. And you can see that, you know, there are certainly a different whole spectrum of emotions that anyone can feel at any given time. And the question that a lot of people then ask me is like, is it normal to feel like this? Why do I feel all of this all at once? And my question and my answer to that question is yes, um, all of this is valid. Why is that? Is because we have to recognize that what we're really going through right now is what we call a collective trauma. And we think about the definition of trauma a little bit. All it says is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. Now, there are many ways in which some people may say, well, it's not traumatic at all. Um, but if we literally take that definition, I would venture to say that some of us have found this to be a very distressing and disturbing experience. Some of us are being told that we have to stay inside homes. Um, you know, many businesses are disrupted. Um, how we learn has been completely transformed. Um, how we interact with people have been completely transformed. So there is an element of disruption um, that has made this in a way that I think there is, a, a, we have to recognize and use that word in a very honest Honorable way to say that this is pretty traumatic. And what happens to our bodies and our physi physiological response when we are interfacing with a traumatic event? So I put this in, I don't know if some of you guys have taken biology in any way, but this is the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And it's something that is like um, a little bit of a primer for me to review that this is happening in your body, um, whether you are recognizing it or not, it's a very visceral autonomic response. So anytime we do experience any types of stress, the brain um, secretes a hormone, you know, that then sends down a series of messengers down to these little adrenal glands on, that sits on top of our kidneys and the adrenal glands secretes cortisol. Now, we all talk about like, oh, the adrenaline rush or cortisol, right? Well, cortisol is our stress response and it amplifies um, a lot of our physiological reaction. Many of you guys have also heard about the fight or flight. And this is exactly what cortisol does. It prepares us in times of stressful events, right? To come up with an appropriate response. Are we gonna fight this, this trigger, right? Or are we going to run and flight away from it? Um, some people have risen to the occasion and be like, you know what, I'm going to step up, I'm going to fight. Um, but some people may actually find themselves really shutting down and, and running and trying to avoid that stress altogether. And every one of us responds to it very differently. So what happens to our body when we undergo through this whole physiological change? Well, you can see that from the top down, right, things start to happen. It could be a headache that we start feeling, a change in how we focus, um, you know, how we eat, um, how we concentrate, how we remember things. And that sometimes can heighten our arousal in a way that maybe affect also the way we sleep. 
Um, some of us may start developing hives, rash, or maybe a, 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 you know an acne episode um, in our faces. Some of us may feel that sensation in our muscles. There'll be more tension. Um, and some of us may feel like our heart, there's this chance of heaviness or that we may feel like our heart's like jumping out of our chest or having these heart palpitations. Um, or maybe sometimes it may come in the form of how we, you know, feel our gut, like maybe there might be some abdominal cramping or feeling like I want to puke, or it may be that I'm just going to eat and cope or maybe even having some episodes of diarrhea. Um, and certainly when we have these kind of stressful responses, um, our immune system um, you know, becomes a little bit taxed and we may be more susceptible to um, you know, getting, getting a little bit sick. So in light of all of that, knowing a little bit now about how our body right, is responding to all of these stresses, all of these disruptions, all of these changes in our lives. I want you guys to think about what have you all been doing during this time. Now, I've been staying at home, right, sometimes, but there are still days I still have to go into the hospital. Um, and I want you guys to think about, well, I've been staying at home, right, living in a pandemic, trying to, some of you guys may say, study calculus, pass an exam, cook, take care of my younger siblings. Here are my here are my responses, okay, to this prompt. So what are my responsibilities? Um, so I still work, and these are some of my colleagues in the emergency room. Um, I also set up a telepsychiatry service for the ER and so that I can see some patients at home um, remotely on certain days of the week. And then on certain other days, um, I go into the hospital and I'm donning on my full PPE with my goggles and my mask to be able to see patients. What are my other responsibilities? Um, I'm a parent. Right, so I have to care for my children and also engage them in remote learning. Um, this is cute. Um, I also have to clean and cook, um, but I'm trying to delegate and have some some of that be done by the teamwork as a family member. Right, and you know, there's a slogan saying that you know the best way to do this is to try to keep a schedule, and sometimes it's just impossible, and I can barely keep it up. And we try, maybe maybe not in so much of the structured activities, but we try to be consistent about waking up every day at a consistent time, having our meals at a consistent time, and going to bed at a consistent time. And I think that for, for, for my family, um, that's all that we've been able to achieve. And then in addition to my work responsibility, to my home responsibilities, right, I also want to make sure that I check in on my family who are near and far. So... I find myself when I'm not engaging in all those activities, I'm on Zoom calls um, or FaceTime, you know, celebrating milestones um, like a birthday and also checking in to make sure that my family is doing okay. And, you know, I thought about for a moment, I'm like, yeah, we're all doing the best as I can. And even saying as best as I can sometimes sets this expectation that we still have more to do, that we still could be better at what we do. And I thought that, you know, not just for myself, but for so many other people, we need to change that uh, frame of mind a little bit and say, you know what, scratch that. Because what I'm doing is actually more than enough. Um, and I want to encourage all of you to start thinking that way too, because let's change that for a moment. If I was just to list all of those things and I'm able to manage and juggle all of that, that's really a lot more than what we should be expecting ourselves at this given point in time, because we are living through a pandemic and we know that there are physi physiological response changes in our body that is impacting how we are able to remember things, um, think things through, concentrate and focus. So some of the things that I decided that I'm gonna put on hold because I simply can't get to it, right, are things that, you know, 
before COVID, I would be doing, which would be research activities, reading and catching up on scientific journal articles, volunteer work, advocacy work, scientific writing. Um, you know, I'm a member of a number of um, organizations. And to be quite frank, you know, we would have meetings. And rather than, you know, actually raising my hand and saying, I'm going to do this, I volunteer to do that. I'm just like, you know, my, I'm, I'm, my plate is a little bit full right now. And I just really simply can't do all of those things. Um, and I explained a little bit earlier that when we go through stressful reactions or we're responding to a disaster, right, there are tangible physical and cognitive changes. So on the left of all the physical things that I kind of highlighted, but think about all the cognitive effects that the cortisol um, has on our brain. It impacts our concentration, our decision-making ability, our memory. Um, you know, maybe you might feel like, you know, wow, I can't do it all, right? And it makes us question our sense of self, our self-worth, our self-esteem, our self-efficacy. And we can kind of go into this kind of, you know, um, role of maybe thinking and worrying a lot more than we should be. And I think that we have to kind of remember, and I really like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And it divides us into five tiers. And the idea is, is that you have to meet the foundation of the bottom tiers first before you can move on and go through the higher tiers of, of um, you know, human needs, right? So ideally, we want to be in a place where there's esteem, we're able to do things, we're able to problem solve, we can able to tackle AP calculus, AP bio, regions, you know, physics and things like that, um, and also you know, practice your piano and play orchestra and do all that. And sometimes we just have to say, for now, this is where we are, right? Um, for many of us, right, we may have family members who are, you know, um, losing jobs, um, who are, have not been able to work. Money might be very, very tight. And we need to think about basic needs, like, am I going to have a roof over my head? Um, is my family going to be okay? Are we going to be able to afford next you know, month's rent check? And are we going to be able to make sure that there's enough for all of us to eat? So we're kind of back down to the lower tiers of our needs right now to make sure that those are met. Um, and having a sense of safety, right? Now, I mentioned earlier that, you know, just last week, I was, I unfortunately lost two family members. And since then, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, are the rest of my family going to be okay? How are my cousins holding up, you know, with the loss of their dad? Um, you know, all these things are things that are just looming over our head right now. And so we have to be kind of mindful that physiological needs and psychological safety are the two needs that we are really kind of focusing and working on right now. And for now, we may have to put the other things that are higher order on the back burner because we are kind of in a, in a place where, you know, we have to think about tangible things. So knowing that, knowing that all of us, um, you know, have many hats and many worries and trying to all meet our needs, right? We also wanna think about what our future holds because we know that this pandemic, you know, um, just as quickly as it comes, it may I mean, it may not be as quickly as it leaves, right? It's also going to be not forever, right? We're going to eventually find, you know, some some intervention that will allow us to be able to manage and control, um, you know, the virus in a way that is different from how we're managing it now. And I think that it's important for us to think about, you know, a little bit of a little bit of hope, right? And what we may hope for when this pandemic comes through. Um, and so I started thinking a lot about that, you know, how are things going to look like in a month's time, in a year's time? What are things that I want to be doing um, and changes that, you know, should be taking place when this is all over? And so here are some things that I came up with. Um, that when I come through this pandemic, I hope to be able to better appreciate my health and take good care of myself, to slow down and tell myself it's okay if I'm doing nothing, um, to remember the loved ones that I lost, 
uh, to celebrate my family and friends, to continue to advocate for mental health needs of youth and families, especially immigrants and people of color. And more than anything, um, I wanna be able to give and get lots of hugs because that's something I think the physical touch we we all long for and we're as human beings that we, um, you know, so so thrive on um, is something that I'm really am missing, and I'm really hopeful that I would be able to be on the receiving and a giving end of this um, when this is when this gets better. So, just going through this, right in those prompts, I have created my own COVID nineteen experience, and it's you know a paragraph long. But at the same time, it also captures everything that I have been experiencing during this time. Um, and hopefully just in going through those prompts, all of you may have had the opportunity to come up with a similar paragraph. And I want you guys to maybe take this time to maybe read through what I have put up and also maybe read through a little bit of what you have put all together. Okay. So as I said, I hope that you had a chance to read it out loud to yourself. And more importantly, when their moment comes that you may be able to read it out loud to others. And maybe even just to say, and you know what, I'm going to post this up on social media. And I actually might find myself doing that after this talk is over. Um, I think it's important to also think about um, some other things that we can be doing during this time. Um, I think that it's important to create a sense of meaning in what we're doing and pause for a little bit. Um, but these are things that I always advise um, many people who are or going through intense stressors in the crisis um, to really do when they leave the emergency room. And I think it's important that we make sure that we can identify three people that you can count on to reach out to. And there's actually an app called My3. Um, it's actually like a, a lingo, it says My3. Um, and these are the three people that you know that you can really open up to, people you know who won't judge you, and people who accept you for who you are, and preferably, um, if you can put one adult in there, that would be awesome, because I also know that chances are you may just put three friends. Um, but having an adult in one of those three, whether that may be your parent or an uncle, a teacher, um, you know, someone from church, someone from temple, um, someone that you know that you can count on and be there for you in the ways that I just described is immensely helpful. And even that could be a mentor too. Um, Fresh air. Um, I know that stay at home is an edict and an order. Um, at the same time, I think um, the governor has done a good job in making sure that people are not restricted from going outside. Um, even if you can go once a day and make sure that you maintain social distancing, so six feet apart, if there is a path, a park, you just walk around the block, that would be helpful to be able to reset because there's something to be said about confinement. Um, and it can be very, um, stressful for, for an individual and for the physical health as well. So even if you just go out, take a walk for 15 minutes, that will be really helpful um, to, to, to kind of, you know, uplift your spirits when things really get down. And then every day I do this practice where I really try to find something um, as trivial as it may be to try to be thankful for. It could be something small. It could just be something like, you know, I'm really thankful that um, I got to help a patient today, or I'm really thankful that I 
recover from COVID, or I'm really thankful that um, my toast didn't get burnt today. You know, it can't be something really small, but having something to be thankful for is really grounded because that helps us to see that in the midst of all the stress, in the midst of all the not so good things that we're hearing, there is something small, right, that we can be blessed for and we can be, you know, grateful for. So these are things that I try to do, um, maybe not on a daily basis, but definitely throughout the week, um, I try to do and try to cover all of those three bases. Now, I also work in an emergency room and sometimes the stress does get the better of me. And one of the things that I have used, which has been tremendously helpful, is actually what I call box breathing. And there is an actual scientific basis to it because it really helps to reset our parasympathetic system response. And it's actually what Navy SEALs use um, during in times of their crises. Um, and if some of you may be doing yoga, it actually may be called the Sama Vitri Pramanat pranayama. Um, and what you do is, is that you inhale for four seconds. And as you inhale, right, the belly goes out and you push the belly out and you hold it for four seconds. And then you exhale and then your belly comes back in for four seconds. And then you hold before you take your next inhale. Uh, we can even practice doing that as we speak. So I'm going to take an inhale. I held it for four seconds. And then I exhale and belly out for four, three, two, one. And then I hold for four seconds, three, two, one. It seems so trivial, um, but if you do three sets of box breathings, which will take you a matter of a minute, right? You can actually lower your heart rate, lower your blood pressure, and actually refocus um, on the work that you're doing. And I've can't count how many times in the busy emergency room setting I've had to just use this, step away, do a couple of box briefings before I actually venture back into the stress of the of the of, of the line of work. Oops, go back. Now, there are also a couple of other additional mental wellness resources that I want to bring to your attention. And I really love Safe Space because I think it's so um I think teen friendly. Um, it's the Vibrant Emotional Health Organization. It's formerly known as the Mental Health Association of New York City. And if you go on that link, there's a safe space. And all you can do is just say, what would you help, what would help you right now? And you can be like, I want a connection. And you click, you can connect with someone who's available um, to be able to chat with you. It may be like, I just want some coping tools and some distractions, right? And you click on that and there's something that you can use. Or to say, I just want something to distract me. Or you say, I have no idea what I want. And you just click on no preference. And then they'll guide you to um, something that you know you can be able to interact with. And I really love offering that um, to, to a lot of teenagers that I work with because it's just something that you can interact with right away. Now, I also belong to the American Academy of Child Health and Psychiatry. That's my home professional organization. And we were able to also put up a list of resources, um, you know, whether that may be coping with stress, anxiety, um, you know, there's tons of toolkits there and resources and reading materials that you can also be able to access during that time. And a couple of things that I think it's so important as we emphasize and talking about wellness and resilience during this time is, is that we all have to be gentle on ourselves and keep reminding that we are all doing enough. And I know that, you know, in different roles, sometimes parents will still put pressures on us saying, you know, you still got to do all your coursework, you know, you still got to graduate, you still got to get the grades that you need to get into the colleges that you want. And just remember that you're doing enough. I mean, there's a reason why the mayor changed all the grading policies for a moment because we recognize that how things used to be and how things are now are not the same. And every one of us are managing differently. Um, teachers are working in really uncharted territories right now. I mean, they went from having to, you know, construct lessons plans and teaching plans, you know, the way they've done it for years and years. And then in a matter of days and weeks are told, Here's a virtual platform, plan your lessons plan that way. And I, I, I mean, having some, having said so that I had to 
you know, in years of doing a, a way of seeing patients, I had literally four days to come up to a telepsychiatry platform. It was so stressful and so overwhelming working with IT, setting it up, making sure that it works, in servicing all the doctors around to make sure that they knew how to use the platform um, and then actually utilizing it and seeing patients. It was such a novel experience for me. I think about how stressful it was for the first few weeks and it's still even stressful for me right now um, because it's still so new. Um, and yet all I can say is that, you know, I'm doing enough and you know, this, this, this is, this is, this is better than, than no care at all. So I would just encourage all of you to be gentle, to be patient on yourself, to be patient on others, practice love and kindness. Um, you know, we're all trying to find new ways of doing something. And every time there's something new, there's always change and change is anxiety provoking. And that's why we are, we're human beings of creatures of comfort. We like how things used to be. Um, and this has really been a, a transformative experience for all of us. Um, and we're all just doing enough. Um, with crisis also, I remember comes opportunity, whether that may be for growth, for learning, for understanding, and for appreciation. Because of all of this, we have found new ways of doing something. We're all learning, we're all growing. And some of these things are good, they're so great, they might be here to stay, and some may not be. And that's okay too, because we're all learning from all of this. And just remember that we're all in this together, we truly are. None of us are not impacted by COVID-19. And more importantly, we're never gonna forget this experience. And for all the rising seniors and graduates who are heading on to the next chapter of their lives, um, who may be looking for that once in a lifetime milestone of a prom or a high school graduation or a senior trip or senior prank day, uh, all of that have been, I think for a lack of a better word, taken away from you guys. Um, and you're never gonna forget that. Um, and I know I will never forget this experience also. So I am a big Harry Potter fan. Um, and as all you know, love is what you know protected Harry. And I think that we all have to remember that if we practice and embrace love um, to each other, to ourselves, we're going to get through this and protect us through all of this. Um, but I really found this quote to be really meaningful. And it's from Luna Lovegood, the character in Harry Potter, and says that the things we lose have a way of coming back to us in the end, if not always in the way we expect. And I think that that's how we got to look and have that kind of frame in mind that, you know, we've lost a lot um, during these past few weeks and things will eventually start coming back to us. Um, and I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be the same as we remember. Even just going to a supermarket is a lot different now. Even getting food um, is a lot different now. And I think that some of these changes are going to be with us for a bit of a time. Um, I'm being mindful that um, originally this talk was supposed to end at seven and I definitely wanted to make sure that maybe I would have an opportunity to hear some of your collective narratives and have an opportunity to ask me any questions. So with that in mind, I wanna turn the floor over. This is my contact information um, to turn it over to Hital to be able to navigate any questions or any um, anyone who's brave enough to share their uh, narrative with us. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. And yes, we do have um, Soiree, who is a speak mentee. She did share her narrative. Um, if you don't mind, I'll actually read that out loud. She dropped it in the chat. It's, I am a daughter and sister. And with COVID-19, I've been feeling tired, as well as thankful that my parents have jobs to support our family. Exactly. Well, thank you, Story, for sharing that. I'm curious to know whether anyone may be also willing to share what they've written, too. If there's anyone else that wants to drop it in the chat, for sure, please do. Um, and I actually wanted to ask on behalf of some of what I know our students are dealing with is a lot of um, a lot of different resources being shared with them and a lot of expectations that they're having to meet right now um, while going through a transition. So if you were to speak to some of our educators who may be watching, 
Um, what would you say to them just in terms of either, you know, maybe lightening the load or just uh, in terms of making sure that assignments have more of a flexible deliver delivery timeline? What would you say to them? And then also what, what might you say maybe in that same response to some of the students who feel that um, there is that conflict between them and the educators because they think that the educators are putting too much on them? Right. And I think that that's where I have to draw back to one of the slides that I had. Let me just go back. Um, let me. So I, I, I really want to emphasize that, you know, with crisis comes opportunity for growth, learning, understanding and appreciation, because um, I think that, as I said earlier, that we as humans are such creatures of patterns creatures of comfort and creatures of habits and that you know when things can get really overwhelming sometimes we respond by actually wanting to have more sense of control and one of the things that i knew as a professional is is that you know i still wanted to have an element of control about how things are being done in the emergency room um and you know i had to be gentle on myself and I had to be gentle on others um, and to re recognize that in order for me to adapt, I have to have flexibility. So that may be flexibility in terms of, um, you know, deadlines for assignments um, and, and being mindful and recognizing that we're all going through different um, um, stressors. Um, so example, personal experience. Last week, I lost two loved ones, um, COVID-19 related. And I was simply not able to perform all my work at hand. And, um, you know, I, I, I mean, first of all, I would encourage um, many of you on the students end to, to, to allow yourselves to be vulnerable and to say, you know what, I, I really am trying my best and I'm really doing more than enough. And I really just can't, if I, if I take this on right now, I'm going to lose it, right? And be a little bit, um, Go, allow yourself to be a little more vulnerable and ask for help. And, and by help, maybe emailing your educators and say, you know, I, I'm doing, you know, a lot. And this is one thing that I think I cannot meet this week. Um, is there a way for me to ask for an extension? Um, so a little bit have to come from you and saying, I really need to get an extension on this and be have a little flexible. And I would encourage educators to do the same, that we can't assume that everyone is doing well. We can't assume that everyone um, is not, uh, is all functioning fine. I mean, all it takes is one, one event in a day's time. Let's say, you know, maybe parents losing their jobs or someone losing their lives for all of us to kind of be thrown into an upheaval where we're not able to meet those deadlines. So I think creating a sense of flexibility um, uh, giving the benefit of the doubt, um, picking out battles a little bit is really important and working together and not against each other um, to, to really kind of get through these learning and, and assignments and, and lessons plan. Um, it does require all of us to be in a place of vulnerability and it's not easy to do. Yes, and I, um, you know, again, for everything that you're dealing with and our deepest condolences uh, to you for your loss, for you to still have um, put time last week into this presentation and for you to be here today is, um, is just, is tremendous. So thank you for that. Um, if you can, uh, given that you work with a population that we work with, um, what are some common, and I know that you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but what are you noticing maybe is the most common um, feeling or response that many of the adolescents are feeling right now, and especially what should um, educators and what should the adults and the parents that we have watching as well be aware of that maybe children aren't speaking up about? Yeah, so I would say that I, I mean, last week I saw a lot of, um, it was quite a busy, busy ER. I think like a lot of people just reached a breaking point. Um, I think parents are becoming frustrated, right? That there's a level of, you know, not listening, a lot of oppositionality. Um, and then the kids themselves feeling really trapped. Um, they feel like that, you know, there's just a sense of unrealistic expectations on them. Um, they, you know, there were parents who were worried about anyone leaving the house because um, they were gonna bring back, you know, the virus. Um, and there was so much contention. Um, and, you know, I, 
so one of the things that I think a lot of parents I heard a lot from was they're constantly on the phone, they're talking to their friends, they're staying up in the middle of the night. Um, you can't get them to sleep on time and uh, all these things. And I, I kind of had to remind all of us that all the parents that I was working with and all the, all, all the teenagers, like we have to be working together. We can't be working against each other. Um, so I think one of the teenagers was like, my mom took my skateboard away. She said that I can't go out and skateboard anymore. And that's my coping mechanism. And if I don't have that, um, then I'm I'm gonna feel you know really trapped. And that's where I do things that I don't want to do. So it was able to talk to the mom and said, you know, now is the time maybe not to do this all or nothing thing, right? Now is not the time for us to say yes, all skateboard and no skateboard. Now is the time to be like, okay, you can use the skateboard in a responsible way, right? Make sure you wear your helmet. Make sure you wear a mask go out in daylight, skateboard for like 30 or 40 minutes and come back and then, you know, make sure you wash your hands, make sure that you kind of, you know, change out your clothes and everything like that so that you're still able to get that, you know, um, ability to 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 do the things that is going to make you feel a little bit better and not feel trapped. And then having a sense of rules to say, okay, you're not going to, you know, sneak out at home in the middle of the night wearing, you know, um, you know, uh, dark attire and then skateboard across the city. So that's not going to work either. So it's finding that middle ground, um, give and take a little bit. It's really important. And, and really remember not to work against each other um, and to work with one another. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I think that's, that's definitely one of the most important things is that um, understanding each other is the most important thing right now to be able to get through this together. Um, for for some of those, uh, or maybe if you can speak to when you when you don't even understand yourself or you're not really sure exactly what you're processing. So in terms of you know grief and for people who've lost um, loved ones to COVID, people who haven't been able to say a proper goodbye and they're not exactly sure what, how to process what they're feeling. Um, especially our young people who you know they're still they're still developing and so. Um, they may not have those tools. What are some techniques so that they know who to go to? Um, and again, if we can also speak to, sometimes you don't feel comfortable going to your family members um, or your you know, cer certain people. What would you recommend? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's so um, critical to have the My3, right? It may not be an adult, may not be a family member, but it may be someone who you know you can reach out to, who you know is not going to judge you. And then for now, that might be your peer. That might be your friend, um, and just know that some of some 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 there's always going to be someone there for you. And if not, that's why I gave you the um, safe space because there's always going to be someone there. Um, you're never alone, and now you all have my contact information, and also know that you know um, you can always reach out to. Um, with grief comes a myriad of emotions, and all of us cope with grief very differently. So I'll tell you my own personal anecdote. Um, I, I'm always in crisis mode. So when I work in the ER, when things get really overwhelming, I, I know, okay, I need to do X and Y and Z, right? And sometimes I am so in X, Y, and Z mode as of last week that it wasn't until I had the weekend then that I realized I was finding myself very angry. Um, why am I feeling so angry? Why am I feeling like after I have this like, you know, explosive outburst of screaming and, and wanting to punch a wall, I just broke down crying. Um, and, and then I realized that, you know, I had to honor that emotion that is inside of me. Um, and I couldn't, you know, just sweep it underneath the carpet. And so those emotions are really powerful. And I got to think of myself as like an analogy and an imagery that it's almost like as if you are standing on the shore and a big wave just comes right at you, right? And it crashes and it hits you hard and you probably fall down on the sand, right? And you're probably like gargling in water because the wave water is so high that, you know, it just, you know, you know kind of like pulled you under. And then you got to remember that, hey, um, that water and that wave recedes. And that 
has allowed me to cope with all those emotions and allow me to be able to be here with you guys, um, to be able to talk about it and to be able to, um, you know, do this kind of work. Because if I don't allow myself to experience those emotions and as scary and as strong and powerful they may be, um, I would not be able to recover and redraw on my strength to continue on a day to day basis. Yeah, and I think um, I, I did drop the in the chat. Uh, it was um, the safe space was dropped in the chat. So hopefully everyone can also take a look at that. Uh, I have my three. Um, and for me, my three does include a best friend and includes um, parents, which I kind of lump as one. So I have uh, two, two parents uh, and then best friends or close peers. But I think what we really need to remember right now is that when we are going through so much change, when we are going through a lot of grieving and a lot of loss, it's important to um, have that My3. And it can, I mean, I'm assuming, would you recommend that it could even be a new, brand new My3? Because um, some of the students are not physically with each other. The educators are not you know, with their peers or colleagues. So a new My3 might even pop up. Right. Yeah. I mean, my three, you know, used to be all my colleagues. I'm constantly at work. I can come up with my three that are like constantly sharing office space. But now my three has been more about, um, you know, um, uh, who would it be? I'm thinking about myself. My three is actually like my sisters, right? Um, not so much my parents anymore, actually, but also um, two good friends of mine. Um, you know, one of them a psychiatrist, you know, and another one who's not a psychiatrist. Um, so my three has evolved in COVID-19 in a very much different way than how it was maybe back in February. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always important to also have people with varied perspectives. It keeps me grounded. Um, I think people who just kind of promote or are very similar to your thought process might keep you in that same place rather than help you move into a different place. Exactly. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Lee. We really appreciate your time here and um, all of the time and effort that you've put into this presentation. This will be shared on our YouTube. So please uh, feel free to visit our YouTube. And again, thank you everyone for joining. We apologize mm -hmm. for the technical difficulties. They happen in a time of virtual connections. So. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me and thank you for giving this time to be able to share to share what I can share with all of you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Stay connected.